To kick off, we have Simon Fox. And we're privileged to hear from him because this is the first time that he's spoken at a media industry event. He became chief executive of Trinity Mirror last September. So until recently, he was an outsider in our industry. And I know he's going to have some observations about the things that we do well and some of the inefficiencies and issues that perhaps we need to tackle. He has already made significant changes at Trinity Mirror and thought deeply about the digital economy, the importance of brands, and where the future is going to lead us. And in his commendably honest email to group staff in October, a month after he joined, he spoke of his mission to deliver great journalism every day and to see circulation and advertising increasing. Simon has agreed to take questions at the end, so as he speaks, uh, if you have any burning questions, uh, you'll have a chance to, offer it, to uh, ask them at the end of his speech. Ladies and gentlemen, Simon Fox. Well, good morning, everybody. It really is uh, it's a, a real honor uh, to be here. Uh, I've been at Trinity Mirror for uh, seven months, and um, I, I want to share with you my initial observations uh, of the industry. Um, but before I do, I'd like to tell you a little story. Um, I was uh, at an advertising agent the other day, and um, who will remain nameless, had a rather dismissive attitude to newspapers, and he sort of was glancing through the paper, and uh, he said to me, Simon, what, what have you done? What have you done? He said, you know, do you not understand that in America, the amount of advertising going into newspapers has halved in the last five years. He said, selling DVDs and CDs is nothing compared to selling newspapers. He said, do you not understand that the trend in newspaper advertising in the UK is going to go exactly the same way? He said, do you not realise that newspapers will soon only be used for lighting fires or cleaning shoes, or, I don't know, cleaning your mirror, whatever it is that you do with newspapers. And I, I, I have to say I found this a little bit depressing as, as, a, as, a, as a notion. And, and I said to him, you know what, uh, old matey, I, I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> okay, <laughs> on to the serious stuff. Um, so I've been here for seven months in the industry, and uh, I've got to say uh, I'm absolutely loving it. It is a great industry to be part of. Um, at the heart of our industry, of course, are our journalists. And I believe, as the video um, illustrated, that the British press is the very best in the world. It's professional, it's lively, it's provocative, it's passionate. I mean, we just have to look at the coverage over last week. The death of Mrs. Thatcher, the alarming developments in North Korea, to see the vital role played by the press in this country. And for as long as we as an industry produce well-written, distinctive, engaging journalism and publish it across whatever media best suits our readers, then we will continue to operate strong businesses. We all know that the printed newspaper is and will remain in gradual decline, but newspapers still reach 72% of all UK adults each week, and Trinity Mirror alone reaches 16 million people weekly across the UK. And for advertisers, the printed newspaper has a more clearly differentiated position and distinctive audience compared to almost any other form of media. In addition, we have deep insight into the lives, behavior, and expectations of our readers. We are, of course, an industry facing extraordinary rates of change. I love these two pictures showing the difference between the papal conclave to elect uh, Benedict XVI back in 2005 with not a smartphone in sight 
and what happened just a few weeks ago for the election of Pope Francis. The explosion of tablets and smartphones is not just changing the way we consume media, but it's also changing our role in the production of it. The growth of news aggregation, news personalization, the role of social media are fundamentally changing our industry. So my initial observations are that the press industry is a fantastically exciting one to be part of. But it's an industry facing immense and exponentially increasing rates of change. The good news, I believe, is that most news brands are doing a good job of adapting to this changing world. We all recognize that our content must now be published across multiple devices, and virtually every day there's an announcement about someone trying something new. The recent financial information from DMGT, amongst others, showing that digital revenue is offsetting print declines is encouraging for us all. However, in this fast changing world, we all need to be prepared to learn, to respond, and to change course when required. So maybe uh, let's turn to some of the things that I found more surprising, um, different to what I was expecting. I'm surprised that booking a press ad, particularly for regionals, is not, as, is not more efficient. We need to make the process as efficient, seamless, and profitable as possible for all parties, and I don't believe we're doing that. Secondly, given the importance of consumer data and insight for our advertisers, I'm surprised we're not sharing circulation data more regularly. An advertiser can get TV viewing figures within a day or two, but as an industry, we only publish our circulation figures monthly for nationals, and six monthly for regionals. And indeed, some papers are even withdrawing from providing this data altogether. I've also been slightly surprised by the lack of rigor around the language of digital. Uh, let me explain what I mean uh, by that, and, and using the Daily Mail as an example, given their evident leadership in digital. In press, we talk about daily circulation, or perhaps daily readership. In digital, we quote monthly figures. In press, we provide clearly deduped figures on our UK readership. In digital, we generally quote worldwide statistics, which are often not properly adjusted for duplicate records. In press, we would never dream of using the statistic of page views. If we did, as the graph here shows, the Daily Mail would have 370 million daily physical page views compared to 57 million digital page views for Mail Online. This hyperinflation in the language of digital is not helping anybody, least of all our advertisers. It's clear to me that we urgently need a robust, rigorous, and consistent way of describing our respective cross-platform audiences. The NRS PAD data is a good start, providing deduplicated reach for both print and online. However, even this excludes the vitally important mobile and tablet readers. If we're to be successful as an industry in migrating to a digital world, this must be a priority. As I look around the industry, it's clear that there is no single right answer. Each news brand is distinctly different, and therefore each of us needs to shape the future that best suits our own individual readers and advertisers. Whilst a paywall strategy might be right for some, it may not be right for others. So let me share with you, if I may, my early thoughts about what we think is right for Trinity Mirror. I mentioned earlier that there were inefficiencies in the ad booking process. To address this, we've recently reorganized our own advertising teams by bringing our previously separated regional and national advertising sales teams together under NASA, the National Advertising Sales Agency. We sell space. As you're no doubt aware, 
we also, last year, launched the national package comprising multiple daily titles across various regional publishers to achieve national scale and efficiency. It's a start and there's more to do. I also mentioned that we need to give our advertisers better data about the audience that we're delivering to them. And as such, we will be reporting ABC data for our core regional paid dailies on a monthly rather than six monthly basis from the second half of 2013. And we would be happy to provide our national newspaper sales on a daily or weekly basis if that would be helpful to our advertisers. And on digital, we will work to agree an industry reporting standard that includes tablet and mobiles. We recognize that the future is digital, but we're not turning our back on print. Print may be in decline, but we see no need to hasten its demise. For nine consecutive months, the Daily Mirror has outperformed the popular national dailies market, and we're committed to remain doing so. We're investing in our print products. We've launched hybrid editions of the Manchester Evening News, and more recently, the Birmingham Mail, the Western Mail in Swansea, the Reading Post, and this week, the Aberdonian in Scotland, in order to ensure that we deliver reach for our advertisers. Last Saturday, we launched substantially upgraded Saturday editions of nine regional daily titles. We're also redesigning a number of titles this year. And where appropriate, we're splitting our larger regional dailies into smaller geographic editions, such as in Manchester, where we now have a north and south edition of the Manchester Evening News. We're also bringing technology into the print world. One example of this is the very recent launch of PaperPay. This is a mobile app which allows customers to purchase their newspaper using a mobile phone. This app eliminates the need for paper vouchers at the point of sale. And we'd be delighted to make this technology available to other newspaper groups. In a world where advertising monies will inevitably move away from papers and onto digital channels, our strategy is to ensure we have best-in-class products across all platforms. We believe strongly in the future of e-editions. Our pricing strategy for e-editions will vary depending on the title. Currently, our Daily Mirror and Daily Record e-editions are free Monday to Friday. We're taking this approach because currently we see little substitution away from the printed paper, and therefore we see our e-editions as a way of gaining incremental readership and therefore incremental reach for our advertisers. Since launching our Apple e-edition just before Christmas, we've already had more than 120,000 downloads, and we'll be launching on the Android platform within the next couple of months. We've been delighted with the engagement statistics of our e-readers. The average time spent reading of 30 minutes is only slightly behind the print edition average of 33 minutes, but clearly well ahead of any website average read time. What's most encouraging and really astonishing, actually, is that nearly half of our readers have clicked on an ad within the app. And that is particularly amazing, given how few ads are currently clickable. We don't believe that paywalls would be right for any of our websites at the moment. Our approach is to drive audience reach by improving the quality and content of our websites, both nationally and regionally, and to drive commercial activity from them rather than putting up any barriers to their use. All our websites are being upgraded onto a new technical platform during the course of this year, and we're seeing significant increases in users and engagement as this upgrade occurs. 
Mobile usage already accounts for a quarter of our digital traffic, and we believe that this will continue to grow rapidly. We see no realistic opportunity for mobile paywalls, and once again, we will be looking to drive our mobile traffic and to drive commercial opportunities from this traffic. So, in summary, I am thrilled to have joined this industry at such an exciting point in its evolution. There are no right answers that apply across the board. We each need to experiment and find the routes that work best for our readers and our advertisers. We will all need to experiment, to adapt, and to change constantly. However, as long as we continue to produce first-rate, distinctive, world-class content, then we will attract readers. And if we can truly understand and develop deep insight into our readers, then we will deliver value to advertisers and build commercial opportunities around that audience. So Rufus, those are my thoughts. I hope they've been useful uh, and happy to take any questions. Thanks very much, Simon. Thank you very much, Simon. I, I was particularly interested to hear you talk about audience measurement and the inefficiencies of the booking system because those are two issues that we're exploring at Newsworks. And as a much less accomplished ma magician, I was very impressed with that trick and would love to know how you do it. Uh, we do have time for a few questions and we've got roving mics. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and say your name and the organisation that you represent. Man over here with the beard. Uh, Dan Whitmarsh from Mediacom. I just wondered, you uh, mentioned that newspapers remain the core outlet for quality journalism. I just wondered how you see that fitting with the future of ever-increasing UGC content with variable quality. Well, I think it's a great question. Um, I think UGC content can be incredibly powerful. Um, and certainly, we've now set up teams in our regional news desks whose job is to get, I guess we call them community curators, and their job is to go out there and find the, the right uh, contributors who are, you know, they might be teachers or local policemen or p people running sports clubs or whatever it might be who are prepared to contribute. There is still... A, uh, an editing process that we undertake, but I think harnessing the community to provide content is incredibly important. Um, opening up our websites to, um, to any uh, blog, I think, is, uh, is entirely appropriate. So our Birmingham Mail website, I think it's a, there's about 23 local Birmingham blogs that, that are linked to it. Um, so there's definitely a role for user-generated content. Um, I think professional content will remain at the heart of all our brands, but that we should be open to using community content and integrating it as effectively as we can. Thank you. There's two hands up at the back there. James Rossiter from Morgan Rossiter. Simon, you talked about no need for paywalls now. At what point do you see it financially appropriate to put some sort of limited paywall to recoup your investment? I think that in the, as I said, in the digital world, you've got to constantly change and experiment. Right now, um, I don't think that enough readers would pay for our content to make that a commercially attractive proposition. I think the content that people are prepared to pay for has to be truly distinctive I fully understand why the Financial Times can charge for content. In a world where we have a free Mail Online, a free BBC, a free Guardian, uh, and so many other free news websites, it's hard to see why, if we were to put up a paywall, we would actually be successful in getting substantial revenue from that. So I would rather go for reach, and I believe for us, going for reach, uh, making our news available widely and monetizing that through advertising is the right road forward. However, I don't think you can ever say anything is forever in, 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 you know, in, in the digital world. 
Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, Catherine Rushton from The Telegraph. Um, recently, Trinity Mirror took a stake in Local World, the kind of bind up of lots of uh, different companies' uh, local papers. Why did you stop short of wrapping your own regional titles into that? Um, because uh, that's uh, actually our strategy is to put our regionals and our nationals more closely together. One of the reorganisations we've done, as, as you may be aware, is, is um, working as one Trinity mirror, harnessing our own regional reporters into our national network um, is one reason. Another reason is competition restrictions. Uh, the OFT, I, I don't think, would like to see... Uh, such consolidation of the industry um, and uh, the, the, the coming together of the um, Northcliffe titles and the Islift titles into local world in which we have a 20% stake um, seem to be the best route forward for us. It may allow us in future to benefit from any further industry consolidation so we have a seat at the table um, but it wasn't the right time for us to do anything bigger than that there might be a right time to do something bigger than that. Who can say? You can. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm not going to. <laughs> OK, we've got Thank time you. for one or two more uh, final questions. There's one here and one there, please. Julia, after... I'm Toby Horry from DARE. I just wondered if you'd investigated um, technologies which tried to bring media together, such as Blipper, and what your view was on those sorts of technologies. Sorry. Um, technologies such as Blipper, which try to integrate offline and online media, whether you have looked into those and what your view was on them. Um, I think anything that brings on and offline together is um, absolutely something we should be looking at. We have tried and we have looked at a number of things. Um, I think increasingly we can't see these as two separate worlds. Um, so I, can't, I honestly don't know specifically, um, but... Uh, the principle of making every channel work together effectively has got to be the right one. Thank you. Now, a final question from Julia Hobsbawm. Julia Hobsbawm, Editorial Intelligence. I just wondered if you could comment on your view about Twitter and its relationship to the news. Uh, and I can't help noticing that Trinity Mirror appears to have no tweets and no isn't following anyone on Twitter. So where, where are you on that rather digital of mediums? Oh, I, well, you would be wrong in thinking that. Our um, Mirror Football uh, has 250-odd thousand followers on Twitter. Um, Trinity Mirror has none. Trinity Mirror may not have, but the brands are our newspapers. Um, so we have individual journalists, of course, with Twitter accounts, and we have Mirror Football, Lloyd, uh, Embley, our editor-in-chief, is on Twitter. Um, you know, Twitter is, of course... Um, very important channel. I don't think there's any need for Trinity Mirror, the corporation, to have a Twitter account. But uh, at all of our, the Manchester, even all of our news brands are very active on Twitter. Thank you very much. That's, that's all we've got time for. And I want to thank Simon, not only for his really candid reflections on Trinity Mirror and the direction in which it's heading, but also for being so candid and such a good sport to take the questions from the floor. Not so all. please show your appreciation for Simon. Thank you.